last week <clears throat> and uh, the week before, we were studying <clears throat> how Rabbi Yehuda Halevi understands why there's a conspicuous absence of the afterlife in Tanakh. And Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's conclusion is that the objective and the proper incentive for a Jew is not what awaits him in the afterlife, but how he can achieve ultimate closeness to the Ribbon Shalom while still in this world. And therefore, it's not only um, of secondary importance, the idea of the afterlife, but it's also insufficient incentive because no one's ever been there. It's not something that's within the purview of the human experience of people in this world to be able to report back and say what the afterlife is like. And since it's not something that's tangible, not something that people can experience, uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu felt that it was not a sufficient incentive to be placed in the Torah. And it's really ultimately not what it's all about anyway. It's about coming close with Hashem in this world, uh, which sort of provides us with that experience of closeness. That's really what's supposed to provide us with the incentive, that if we follow in Hashem's ways, if we follow Hashem's commandments, He will be to us as a God and we will be to Him as a people in this world with this great sense of great prophetic closeness with the spirit of the, of the Shekhinah amongst us. That's truly the incentive that Hashem wants us to use in order to follow His ways of the Torah. So <clears throat> that's Rabbi Yehuda Halevi in a nutshell. Um, the, uh, this question has been approached by a number of different medieval commentators because this is a, a very, very vexing issue. It becomes a very vexing issue for a number of the Rishonim, for a number of the medievalists, who feel that this is one of the central issues of our faith. One of the central issues of our theology is is schar v'amesh, is that there's a just God who provides us with proper reward and punishment, and the only way that we can make sense of God's just schar v'amesh, of his proper reward and punishment, is to conclude that there must be something awaiting us after this world, that we cannot assume that everything that is just occurs in this world. There has to be a point of equalization in the next world. And so the fact that the Torah makes no mention, at least not explicitly, of an afterlife compensation is extremely vexing to a number of Rishonim. Now, we do have this idea of a national equalization, of a national um, end of days where Hashem will make everything good, there'll be an ingathering, and they'll, the Jewish people will be reconciled with Hashem. But on an individual level, assuming that every individual is responsible for his or her behavior, and that there ultimately will be compensation for us on an individual basis, that seems to be completely missing from the Torah as far as what happens in the afterlife when we die, and eventually olam haba. And it's such a cornerstone of our faith to the point where the Mishnah says that all of Israel have a portion in the world to come, except certain people who don't have a portion of the world to come. Now included in this uh, group of people who are denied a share in the world to come are people who say that there will be no world to come. If a person denies that there's a possibility that there will be a resurrection and that there will be a continuity of one's living after he dies, then such a person will not merit to have a portion in the world to come. So you see that Chazal were very, very emphatic about the need to affirm and constantly reaffirm our belief in this. And this is what eventually, this is one of the reasons that eventually spurred the Rambam to compile his Shalosha Asar Ikarei Amuna, his 13 principles of faith, one of them being that I believe in the resurrection of the dead, which will bring us to a, a, a perfected existence of Olam Haba. And if, it's, if it is such a cornerstone of our faith, then it should be even more, be even more vexing as to why HaKadosh Baruch Hu would not devote any space in the Torah to give this some level of discussion about, listen, Chevra, you do the mitzvahs, 
you're going to get a good portion, a chilek in olam haba, such as the way that Chazal described it in the Mishnah. And if you remember, I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago that there are certain skeptics and biblical scholars who have argued that the conspicuous absence of the afterlife in Tanakh points to the fact that in the biblical period, the, the belief in an afterlife had not yet been uh, embraced by the ancient Israelites who left Egypt. It was only a belief that was added on afterwards in the times of Ezekiel, in his uh, confrontation with the Zoroastrian culture in the diaspora, where they talked about this idea of an afterlife. And of course, that's not acceptable to a traditional Jew. The reason why the historical explanation is not acceptable is because the premise of this very explanation is that there really is no afterlife, and it's all just a question of, of man-made religion, man-made theology, man-made belief. Right? And so there, there either is an afterlife or there's not an afterlife. If there is an afterlife, then it's always existed from the time of creation. And if there's not an afterlife, so then we're playing games. So, yes, go ahead. Um, maybe when they left Mitzrayim, they thought they would go to Israel, and then Mashiach would come here, and they lived forever, so they didn't have to think of an afterlife because of that time. That's what the idea was. And then the well, then, if that, but you see, but that's the thing, is if, if there was such a belief, and the Torah is therefore only documenting for the Jewish people what they need to think about and they need to do until they get to Eretz Yisrael, then the, the, about three quarters of the Torah is not necessary either because we talk about the rewards of living in Eretz Yisrael, about the Shemitah year, and there's a lot of the things that are in the Torah, the, the, the blessings and curses about following the word of God and not following him, it all becomes superfluous. I'm not sure whether that answer is going to suffice. There is a famous answer that is provided by the Rambam, and it's in the very Mishnah, which he had, Rambam wrote a Mishnah commentary. It was one of the first things that he wrote in his very prodigious uh, literary career. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he wrote it in Arabic, and we have, um, so there are many different translations of the Mishnah commentary in Hebrew, and, and, uh, and so we're taking a loose uh, translation and we're going to study it now. Because as you'll see, the Rambam takes a completely different approach um, uh, from Rabbi Yehuda Halevi as to the absence of the afterlife in, in Tanakh. For Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, the afterlife is of secondary importance for a devoted Jew. And for, but for the Rambam, it's of primary importance. And as a result, he has to come up with a different answer as to why the afterlife is missing from, from, from the Torah. So I'd like to ask for a reader today. We're going to be reading exclusively outside of our texts, outside of our kuzaris today. So, because um, I think this will take most of our time today. So I need a volunteer. You have the sheet in front of you. I need a volunteer who's got a loud voice. Go right ahead. Thank you. I wish for you, who are studying this book, to understand the following analogy. For through it, your heart will be primed to listen to all that I have to say on the matter. Imagine that a small child was brought before the teacher for a Torah lesson. In reality, Torah study is the most beneficial thing for this child. For through, for through it, he achieves excellence. However, because of the child's young age and immature mind, he doesn't appreciate the benefit of this study. Nor does he realize that it will bring him to excellence. And so the teacher, who is more developed than the student, has no choice but to entice the child to study by using those items that a child values as an incentive. So he says to the child, if you read, I'll give you some nuts or figs or maybe even some honey candy. With this incentive in place, the child reads and puts in the effort, not for the sake of the reading itself, for he doesn't appreciate its value, but in order that he will get the food. Clearly, eating the sweets is far more precious and desirable to him than reading. The child looks upon the study as a great chore and burden. He nevertheless engages in it because he knows that through his work, he will get what he loves, namely the nut or the honey candy. When the child gets older and develops a more mature intellect, he no longer values that which he previously thought was important. Instead, he begins to value some other object in his environment. At this point, the teacher will have to entice the child with a new item. So the, so the teacher will say to him, 
If you read, I'll buy you a really snazzy pair of shoes or nice clothes. I don't think that snazzy appears in the original Arabic. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, go, go ahead, please. Once again, the child will put forth the effort to study, not for the sake of the study itself, but for the sake of the clothing. The clothing is more important to him than the Torah. For him, it's the whole reason he's engaging in Torah study. Once the young man develops his intellect even further, he will spurn his old playthings and will instead turn his heart to more important things. His teacher must then say to him, if you study this portion or this paragraph, I'll give you a dollar or two. For now it becomes necessary to entice the student with money. But still, the money is more important to the young man than Torah study. The whole purpose of his studies is to obtain the gold coins that were promised to him. Afterwards, this student matures into an adult. He now realizes that his previous pursuits were dishonorable and that money is really unimportant. He now wants something more out of life. Now his teacher says to him, study more so that you will become a great rabbi or judge. People will honor you. They'll rise to attention in your presence and do what you tell them. Your name will become famous in your lifetime and even after you die. Just think about Rabbi so-and-so who accomplished the same thing. Now, the student continues studying and working hard in order to realize this incentive, his objective, to gain the honor, exaltation, and praise of his fellow human beings. This is all despicable. Realistically speaking, however, man's intellect is limited. By, necess by, necess by necessity, therefore, man must provide for himself some incentive to acquire spiritual wisdom other than the acquisition of wisdom itself. He should therefore say to himself, what am I learning for? I'll do it for the honor. While this approach may be necessary, in reality, it's foolishness. Okay, so we're talking about necessary evils in life, okay? But it's a, I mean, it's a beautiful way of the Rambam's uh, illustrating this idea that life is full of honey candy that we create for ourselves or that others create for us. And without that, we really wouldn't be able to do very much in life because we're not perfect and we're selfish, and we're small-minded, and we're despicable people, <laughs> is basically what he's saying. But it's true. In other words, we're all despicable. Um, and, uh, and we therefore have to cater to that despicable side of ourselves in order to get ourselves doing the right thing. So one might argue that, of course, that uh, uh, how lowly and abject this kind of behavior is, why should we cater to that despicable side of us? Uh, the answer is, as he's about to point out, is that it's better to do mitzvahs for the wrong reasons than not to do mitzvahs at all. It's better to serve God for selfish motives than not to serve Hashem at all. So let's see, let's see how he continues. This is what our sages refer to as not lishma. This is the term used to describe any time a person does the good deed, studies, or toils in the Torah, not for the sake of the spiritual item itself, but for some ulterior, ulterior motive. Our sages of blessed memory have already admonished us about this by saying, do not make them a crown with which you can acquire greatness, nor a pickaxe with which you can dig. This alludes to what we have been saying, that one's objective in studying Torah should not be to receive honor from people or to earn money. One should not make God's Torah his source of income. Instead, the objective should be exclusively for the acquisition of knowledge. After all, the objective of pursuing truth is to acquire truth. The commandments are truth, and thus the goal is their fulfillment. So what do you think the Rambam would have to say about uh, learning in Kolel? I don't think he'd be a very big fan. The Rambam felt that the, the rabbinate is not a profession. It's a, it's, a, it's a labor of love for which a person should not be paid for. He wouldn't think very highly of me either. Again, I'm just, just to let you know, he said, well, you're wasting... Basically, you're, you're paying a guy to do what he's supposed to do anyway, so uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a very honorable job for the Rambam to get compensated for paying or teaching Torah. A person is not supposed to get any kind of personal benefit from serving Hashem. Um, and, and so therefore, any time a person does, he's serving God on a, a far lower level than what is, uh, than what is considered to be the, um, uh, the best way of serving God. Continue, please. It is thus forbidden for a perfected individual to ever say, if I do the good things and stay away from the bad things commanded by God, what will be my reward? 
This is like the youth of above who says, if I study, what will I get? And we have to promise him something in order for him to do it. But that's only because we see his small-mindedness in that he doesn't appreciate the value of the task and therefore seeks an ulterior motive. We thus have to respond to his folly. This is what our sages already warned us about, that we shouldn't have ulterior motives for serving God and doing his mitzvot. This is what the saintly Antigonus of Soho said. Do not be like servants who serve their master with the hope of receiving reward, but rather be like servants who serve their master with the understanding that there will be no reward. The objective of this teaching was to fortify and strengthen the truth within us. This is what is called serving God out of love. All right, so I want you to think about something now that we've seen this mission of Antigonus Ish Soho. This is a famous mission of Pirkei Avos. It's at the very beginning. So think about this for a second. First of all, how is the Rambam answering the question as to the absence of the afterlife in Tanakh? What is ultimately his answer at this point? What have, what have you seen so far? Go ahead. Um, there, what if, there's no reward. The mitzvah itself is the, uh, is the, uh, the reward. I mean, the mitzvah itself, you get so much just because you're doing them serving at them. Is he, is he saying that there's no reward? No, he's just... No, it's just, I, I'm not sure. I'm not. What, what, what is, take, take, take a moment. We're not, we're, not, we're not in a rush today. Take, take a moment and really, up until now, what has the Rambam explained as to why there would be no, it would be not a good thing to write about the afterlife in, in, in the Torah? Yeah. It's a continuation of the list of incentives. Which is not appropriate. Yeah, to have. The, the world honey to come. Candy for a child and yeah. alam haba for a while. Alam haba is a sophisticated piece of honey, honey candy. candy. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Hashem doesn't want us to serve him. You, you know the dangling carrot. You know kind of service. Well, if I serve God with the constant incentive of alam haba in my head, then that's not called serving God. That's serving oneself. Yes, I'm really doing this for me. I'm not doing it for Hashem. That's not what Hashem wants. Hashem wants to serve him for his sake, not for our sake. Now, if that's the approach that the Rambam takes, and that's the reason for the absence of the afterlife in Tanakh, then we also need to consider what the role of the sages is in emphasizing the afterlife to such a great extent. Yes? Um, doesn't that kind of contradict what you said at the beginning that like if you don't like anticipate like you know Olam Haba then you don't have a portion in Olam Haba but if we don't anticipate Olam Haba like according to Rambam then then like it's like our candy so that's why it's not written there but we need to anticipate it in order to get it well you need to believe that it's there but okay. it should not be acting as your incentive if I'm, if I'm, <clears throat> if I enter into a marathon, I may have a number of different incentives to to run the marathon, but my objective should not be to win the prize at the end, but rather, let's say, my objective should be because I'm raising money for charity, okay, or whatever the the altruistic objective is. I know that if I hit the finish line first, I'm going to win, but that's not why I'm running. So that's the idea. So according to the Rambam, there should be no mention of reward and punishment in the Torah at all. Yet it's full of reward and punishment in this world versus the world. To come. Ah, very good. So that's the question. So why is there any reward listed in the Torah? And that's in the lower level. Of <laughs> yes, yes, very good. And not only that, there are so many disincentives. There are so many punishments. If we're supposed to be, it should be consistent, really. <coughs> you know, why is there a curse? Why are we punished if we do bad things? Yes, very good. Why is there this threat of extermination and excommunication? But also something else is bothering me. There's nothing wrong with continuing these levels because Hashem knows what we are. He created us the way we are. So he knows that we do need that lofty candy of Olam Haba. And I think his language is a little bit strong to say this is all despicable. I don't think it's despicable. I think it's human nature. A child is a child. You can't expect him to want to learn Torah because it's so wonderful. He's a child. And by the same token, us adults are basically children. 
and we need that Olam Haba. I think your point is very well taken. In defense of the Rambam's <laughs> language, uh, when you've reached the level of the Rambam, mm -hmm. you have contempt for people who are really, you look at, you look at, there is, there is a certain elitism that you see in the writing of the Rambam because you have to realize the man was a giant among men. He was a giant among men, and when he saw people wasting their time, it just it drove him crazy. So the, there are times, you know, especially he's younger when he writes this, maybe he mellowed out a little bit as he got older, but he realizes that, look at what people are doing in my community. You know, I'm sure we've all had those moments when we, when, you know, moments, of course, Abbas Yisrael, no question, we love every Jew. But there are moments when we say, stop the insanity. What's going on in this community? Everyone's just running around, not thinking about God, and whatever. Notice, whatever the, whatever your soapbox issue is, yeah, yes. But this is the Rambam soapbox issue here. So yes, you're right, despicable is a bit strong. But it's funny at the same time, because, you know, despicable me, you know, it's like, just think about, just think, it, it's, it's good, it's good to remind myself how despicable I am once in a while. Yes, in other words, um, I appreciate your compassion for the human condition, but we shouldn't be so easy on ourselves either. It, it really is despicable when you think about it. It's really, it's self-service, it's not service of God. So, um, we, we need to get back to the issue of what about the rewards and punishments that are written in the Torah? If it's all despicable to be incentivized completely, then what, what, what is being written in the Torah Bichlau at all? Why is there any mention of any reward and punishment in the Torah? So let's, we, we, will, we will get to that. Okay, go ahead. And also, uh, think about what I mentioned before, before, is what is the role of Chazal? If, if we've seen a pattern from the Almighty that he doesn't want to incentivize us with that dangling carrot in front of our face, then why did the sages do a full 180 and they talk about olam haba ad infinitum? And they talk about it, and they talk about it in the Mishnah, they talk about it in the Yemos HaMashiach, they talk about the Gehenim and Gan Eden and all of the various Midrashim. Why is there so much discussion of it if Hashem says that it's really despicable and I don't want you to be thinking about it? Okay, continue please. Our sages stated on the verse in Psalms 112.1, regarding the God-fearing man, his commandments he greatly desires, said Rav Elazar. He desires God and mitzvot, not the reward for those mitzvot. How powerful and clear is this proof, in that it demonstrates clearly that with which he, we began. The rabbis said even more in the Sifre. Perhaps one might say, I shall study Torah so that I will become wealthy, or so that I shall be called Rivet, or so that I shall receive a reward in the world to come. Thus, does scripture state to love Hashem, all that you do, do only out of love? The matter is thus clear from this, and it is also clear that this is the objective of the mitzvahs and the very foundation of the sages' faith. Only one who is foolish and unwise can hide from this truth, in that he was already corrupted by crazy ideas and lowly portrayals. Now, you have to realize the Rambam is writing polemically over here when he talks about crazy people, he's talking about his colleagues um, because there were a lot of crazy ideas that were circulating at the time, talking about how the, the sole objective of a person's service should be for spiritual, for spiritual benefit. And, um, and so it's important to realize that the Rambam it writes, we, we're only taking a small snippet from the Mishnah commentary over here, but the Rambam uh, goes off on a screed against those who are overly simplistic and um, and, um, and just very small-minded about the way that they interpret uh, Talmudic literature and that the way that they understand scripture and the way that they understand Judaism, Jewish, Jewish ideology in general. And so he really needs to emphasize this idea that there are a lot of crazy ideas going out there. Okay, let's continue. Abraham's greatness was that he served Hashem out of love, and it is our obligation to emulate this. But our sages knew that this is a very difficult level to achieve, and that, and that not everyone is able to achieve it. They also realized that when a person first hears this idea, he will be displeased and think it false, since people usually only do things in order to accomplish some benefit for themselves, or to avoid injury. Anything else is wasteful. 
How can we therefore tell a person who follows the Torah to do these actions, but don't do them out of a fear of punishment or with the hope of a reward? This is far too difficult, since not all people can reach the truth and become like Abraham. That is why they permitted the general populace to retain their lower level of ideology, to do that which is good for the sake of receiving reward, and to avoid bad behavior out of fear of punishment. But they also sought to support the individual in his growth and to strengthen his thinking until he'd be able to perceive the truth and the more complete path. This is precisely what we do with the with a young during his period of, of education, using our aforementioned analogy. So Chazal were doing what? They were providing the candy for the un for the for the immature among us. Chazal viewed their role as providing candy for the immature among us. The Torah was speaking to a generation of Jews who were mature, and therefore Hashem told them, I'm not going to write down the, um, the, the candy reward of Olam Haba explicitly, but Chazal realized that as the generations commenced, and as mankind descended into narcissism and selfishness and small-mindedness, it became necessary to accentuate the candy incentive because we had become children once again. So that's basically Chazal are our babysitters. Uh, there are teachers who are providing us with incentives, you know, with the baseball cards or whatever they give out in school these days in order to get us to study Torah properly. Um, and at the same time that they did that, they also peppered their words with reminders that this was really just candy and that it's important for us to remember to try and serve Hashem for a higher purpose as well. That we should work towards the Lishma purpose and not just stay in the Shalom Lishma mode. So therefore, when you find words of Chazal that emphasize the rewards of the afterlife and go uh, into very, very graphic discussions of uh, Olam Haba and Gan Eden and Gehenim, it's really written for a lower level of individual who needs to be incentivized by those things. But someone who really doesn't, someone who has the proper ahava, the love of Hashem like Avraham Avinu, really is not going to spend his or her time focusing on those parts of, of Jewish literature. They're going to st they'll, they'll focus more on the things that I'm supposed to be doing in life, not what awaits me at the end. And so from the Rambam's vantage point, Studying the, those topics is really not where it's at. You know, that's not really what we're supposed to be focusing on in our pursuit of Judaism. Is you know, and it's, by the way, these subjects are fascinating. You know, when you read about these very graphic depictions of the different levels and the different layers of Gehenna, the different levels of Gan Eden, and you sort of illustrate in your own mind, gee, what's going to happen? They're going to hang me by different parts of my body. You know, as discussed in many of the midrashim. Whatever part of your body you sinned with, that's the part of the body they're going to hang you with on a hook, you know, in the next, in Gehenna, you know, you've probably, you've probably heard that medrash. And there are many, many other kinds of depictions. You never heard that before? Okay. Uh, well, let's hold we'll that for another time. <laughs> there are other parts of the, um, there are other parts that are very, very graphic and very, very descriptive. And so... For the Rambam, he says, okay, fine, you need it, fine, go read it. You know, if that's, gonna, if that's what's going to get you off your chair and, and doing the mitzvah, fine. But, you know, that's really, you really shouldn't be uh, incentivized by that. Yeah, Patricia. Well, it's, it, it becomes almost, I'm having trouble with this because it becomes, it becomes almost circular. If you can imagine somebody saying, you know, I really don't care what happens to my neshama after I die. Because as long as I, I love God so much, I don't care if there's no world to come. I'm still going to serve him because I love him so much. You have reached the highest level, but you don't believe in the world to come. Therefore, you have... No, no it's not that you don't believe in it. You believe it exists, but that's not what's getting you off your chair. That's, that, again, that's the, that's the issue that we discussed. By the way, you know, there's this famous story about the Baal Shem Tov. Did you, ever, you know this story? Yeah. It's, it's been related in, a, in the name of other Rebbes as well. But once someone asked the Baal Shem Tov, um, the Baal Shem Tov um, asked the person for a favor. I don't remember all the, I should really know this story well. 
So the Baal Shem Dov asked the person for a favor, and the person said to him, I'll only agree to do this if you give me your share in the world to come. And the Baal Shem Tov said, okay, done. You have my chelik in Olam Haba. And the story then goes on to say that the Baal Shem Tov was with, had tremendous simcha after that. Because he says, I'm no longer burdened with Olam Haba. I no longer have the burden of having to constantly think about why I'm doing this service to Hashem. Now that I know that Olam Haba is out of the way, I can really now serve Hashem out of true Ahava, instead of thinking about what's in it for me. Because I've already given up my Olam Haba. That's it. No longer. You know? So that's the idea that the Rambam is trying to, to impart to us. So anyway, he says, but now, you see, now we know, at least now understand the role of the sages. Let's continue, please. The rabbis were critical of Antigonus of Soho for having publicized what he did. They thus said about him, Wise men, be careful with your words, as we will explain in our Mishnah commentary to Pirkei Avos. Okay, so um, Antigonus is, is criticized in the Mishnah. Now, <clears throat> it, even though the Mishnah in Pirkei Avos doesn't say this explicitly, it just says, Wise men, be careful with your words because you may end up being exiled and you'll take your students with you and your students will be negatively influenced by their environment and uh, then corruption will ensue. And the Rambam in that Mishnah itself says that that's a reference to Antigonos Ish Socho because as it says in another text which is called Avos the Rebbe Nasan, it says that Antigonos had two primary students. One was named was Tzadok and the other one's name was Baitos. And Sadok and Baitos were the progenitors of two sectarian movements during the, second, the end of the Second Temple period, known respectively as the Sadokim or the Tzdukim, the Sadducees, and the Bothusians. And these were two sectarian groups who denied this is, and, and this is, by the way, that we don't know too much about but the, the, the Baitusim, except from the Gemara, because they're not recorded in any independent text. But the Tzedukim are discussed in the, in the New Testament, right? They, their book. And the Tzedukim are also discussed in Josephus. And what Josephus writes about the Sadducees is that he tells us that one of the reasons why the Pharisees were more successful than the, Sad, than the Sadducees was because the Pharisees talked about the afterlife. And the Tzedukim denied the afterlife. They said that when you die, that's it. And they weren't able to attract people to their sect, to, to, to their cult, because people said, this is it? You mean the Romans are going to flog us after we do all the mitzvahs, and, there's the, and that, that's it? So, uh, so as a result, now, the Avos de Reb Nassim explains, how did the Tzedukim develop their theology that there is no afterlife? It was a direct connection to the, the, the old, old teacher, the ancestor of Tzadok and Baitos, Antigonus. Because when he told his students, do not serve Hashem with the hope of receiving a reward, they eventually, through the game of telephone, eventually came to the conclusion that what he really meant to tell them is that there is no world to come, like has been suggested, right? I'm not doing this for the world to come, ergo, world to come doesn't exist. No, no, that's not what Antigonus was trying to teach at all. But that's what it eventually became. And so we understand that the rabbis are not only writing to us to give us the candy, but they're also writing to protect the Jewish population against the tzedukim and the baitusim of their age, who are trying to say that there is no world to come because of this high lofty level that, we try, that the Torah is promoting which is don't serve God with the hope of the world to come, then people will figure will just figure there is no world to come. So then the rabbis have to say, no, Chevro, you got to realize there is a world to come. Look at the, the, um, uh, the, the deterioration of the, our Mesora, of the Jewish people of this time. We need to spell everything out because this is what is happening. The Jewish people are becoming splintered into sects who are creating their, their own crazy theologies, and so we have to spell these things out. Okay, continue, please. Know that the general populace doesn't lose up completely by doing the mitzvahs out of fear of punishment and motivation for reward, just that they're not complete in that service. But it's better for them to do the less than the optimal service so that they will thereby acquire the proper constitution and will be primed for the Torah's fulfillment. 
They will then eventually arrive at the truth and will later serve Hashem out of love. This is why our sages said, a person should always serve Hashem, even if it's on the level the level of Shalolishma, not for the right reasons. For out of the Shalolishma comes Lishma for the right reasons. Okay, so eventually, the belief of Chazal, Chazal have confidence in the human condition. And they say that even if you start off doing things for the wrong reason, you'll eventually become accustomed to it so much, it'll become so much a part of your, of your, uh, of who you are as a human being, that eventually you'll come to enjoy doing them, uh, doing them for the right reasons, even if you're not getting a reward for them. It'll become so much a part of you. Um, th there's more to this commentary, and, and I, I neglected to translate for you the part where he asks the question, what about the rewards and punishments that are written in the Torah? What do we make of those? So there the Rambam writes something very interesting. He says that's not reward. The Torah never writes any reward or punishment. There is no reward and punishment written in the Torah, period. What about the fact that we say in the Shema daily, Benosati, Metar Artsachem, Biito, Yore Umalkosh? Consequence. What's that? It's a consequence. It's not only a consequence, he says even more than just a consequence. He says that if you demonstrate that you're using your time effectively, then I'll free up more time for you to do mitzvahs. It's not a reward. It's God basically telling us a life that is well used will be accommodated. When, when I have to go to work every day, I can have two different kinds of days. I can sit at my desk and the phone barely rings, or I can sit at my desk and I've got a million fires that I have to put out on that particular day. So what determines that? So for the Rambam, it's hashkacha pratis. If I can use my day effectively by doing things in the, exclusively towards the service of the Ribbon Shalolam, and God sees that I'm willing to do that, he'll free up all of my prosaic responsibilities of having to work in the field so that I can do more mitzvahs. So that's not a reward, that's basically God allowing me to do that which I've already demonstrated that I wish to do. So normally, if I, it, a, 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 on a normal season of working in my farm, on, on my field, I have to work eight hours a day in order to plant, mm -hmm. to plow, to, to seed properly, and all of those other things, to water and so forth. But God will bless my property and will bless my land to the point where I'll get the same blessing with only having to work four hours a day on my field, and I'll be able to use the other four hours, though that'll be freed up to, for Torah study, it'll be freed up for doing chesed and delivering things for the poor. So you see, that's not the reward. The reward for the mitzvah? No, 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 that's, that's olam haba. And the punishment, of course, is that we'll be denied all of those things. And basically, Hashem says, if you're using the free time that I gave you to eat bonbons in front of the computer screen, right? Or, well, I don't know, whatever, it used to be in front of the TV, and I've got to change the analogy. <clears throat> so, then, so then Hashem says, I'm going to take away that time that I thought you were, that I, ga I gave you that time to use. In, in the service of Hashem. If you're not going to use that time effectively, then I'll create a life that is filled with crises so that you'll, have, you'll, you'll use your life for, for other reasons. Yeah? Yeah, but the Torah goes much further than that. You see, in the end of 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 well, for the Rambam, that's all included in the, uh, the national, it's a national attitude as well. The, all of the brachas and klalos that you're describing in the book of, uh, of Devarim occur to us on a national level. Diaspora, exile, destruction, and so forth. Hashem says, if we as a people demonstrate that we're not into this, we're not, we're not into divine service, then as a nation, Hashem will place us at a distance and make it harder for us. It's not just harder, it'll make it tortured. And and suffering. I mean, that's not just making it hard, but that's like killing you off. And For the Rambam, that's 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 the that's the way he learns that there's that there's no reward mentioned in the Torah. Punishment, perhaps, you would say, 
that it's uh, maybe, maybe he would hold a little bit differently when it comes to punishment, I'm not sure. Maybe he feels, maybe he would agree that even a righteous person needs to have some level of disincentive written more explicitly, but I'm not sure. I think he writes this, that this holds true for both reward and punishment. That's yeah. what I don't understand. What about the Lama Tesmalachos and when there was a Sanhedrin and people got Malkos? Why, why is... Malkos or the death penalty, yeah. But so why, if you're saying that Hashem wants people to do things on the highest level, why give them punishment? The reason is for, for the sake of society. In order to preserve, it's for the same reason why we don't have those punishments today. Understand that the punishments that are administered by the Sanhedrin are to preserve a holy society, a holy community. They're not there to rehabilitate or to punish the individual. They're there to preserve a certain way of life for an entire community. When we went into the exile and we no longer could maintain our own sense of society or community, all of those things fell by the wayside. It's for that very reason, because that's not the incentive, that's not the reason, it's not a punishment. It's a way of preserving a holy society. We give a person malchus or the death penalty not in order to punish them, because the true recompense only comes in the next world. We give a person malchus or the death penalty in order to be able to create an incentive for the rest of society to function correctly. So you're saying it's only a deterrent? to everyone else, it's Correct. not to the person, but that's, not, that's, that's, that's right. not what we learned growing up. We learned that if you get the punishment and you do tshuva, then the sin is wiped away and you don't have to get a punishment then in the next world. Also on an individual basis. Yeah, no, we're not, that, that, we're not disagreeing with that. We're not disagreeing with that idea. Of course, tshuva expiates sin just as much as su personal suffering expiates sin. But the reason why the Sanhedrin is, is charged with a specific task of meeting out that punishment instead of letting God do it himself is because of society, societal concerns.